Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're back at Blackbird Air Park in Palmdale, California for the 50th year commemoration of the Cold War. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Blackbird Air Park's uh, commemoration, uh, basically, of 50 years of strategic reconnaissance. In reality, I should say 60 years because the start of strategic reconnaissance actually starts with the U-2. To your left, facing me, you'll see one of the very early U-2s, one of the few survivors of it. Uh, basically, why was the U-2 built? My answer to that is because of another airplane, this airplane. I built this when I was a kid. People keep saying, well, were you involved with the U-2 or the A-12? And I said, I was in grade school and then in, and then in high school when those made their first flights. Uh, nevertheless, in the early 50s, I actually did the duck and cover drill for real at my school in Richmond, Virginia. The reason being in the 1950s, everyone was really afraid that we were going to end in a thermonuclear mushroom cloud when the Soviets attacked us and we attacked them back. One question was, we knew the Russians had the bomb, but the question is, did they have the means to deliver it a long distance in a jet bomber and attack the United States? No one knew the answer to that question. We tried parachuting spies into the Soviet Union. They were captured and shot immediately. We tried floating balloons with clouds across the Soviet Union, and we got great pictures of the tops of clouds, and that was about all we got. So basically, in 1954, President Eisenhower decided, okay, we need to basically go deep into the Soviet Union to see do they have bombers enough to attack us? So uh, basically, he said, if we use Air Force airplanes flown by Air Force guys and overfly a foreign country that we're not at war with, we will be at war afterwards. If, on the other hand, the airplane is flown by a civilian, he's what they call a spy. So you line him up against a wall, shoot him, and lodge a protest, and then you go on. So he said, we really need this information. That was the genesis of the U-2. So the U-2, as you can see out there, has some very unusual features, uh, which it flew at altitudes up to 70,000 feet, which in those days, Jet airliners were just coming along and they could reach 35,000 feet or so. Jet fighters can only reach about 50,000 feet. So they said if we fly this thing over the Soviet Union with really good cameras that can photograph a golf ball from 60 or 70,000 feet, we'll find out what we need to know. So as a result, they built a small fleet of these airplanes for cover. They called them the U-2, U stands for utility, which means we'll just figure out a job for it to do. In reality, it was built to be a spy plane. The Air Force, by the way, I flew photo reconnaissance phantoms in Vietnam, flew 169 missions, got hit three times because we flew at 2,000 feet rather than 70,000 feet. But nevertheless, the Air Force says it's a reconnaissance airplane. Don't call it a spy plane. No one can spell reconnaissance properly, so it's much easier to call it a spy plane. So if you hear me say spy plane, translate that into reconnaissance if it has US Air Force on the side. Okay, like I say, you can see the U-2 over there. It's got some really interesting characteristics. And uh, basically, we have here on the uh, podium here with us, uh, on your right is Mr. Lewis Setter who actually was one of the first instructor pilots for the early U-2s. He actually taught Francis Gary Powers to fly the U-2. In addition, uh, we have Tony Bavacqua, who flew the U-2 and then later flew the SR-71. So he got to fly the two premier strategic reconnaissance airplanes. Today, at the moment, we're going to ask him to talk about uh, the U-2. 
Uh, actually, I'm just going to ask uh, Lewis a question, and he can answer it, and then uh, sp uh, speak about if anything else he wants to. Uh, Lewis, uh, looking at the U2, uh, the first thing you notice about it, it's got really funny-looking landing gear. You want to comment on that compared to what you were used to flying? Many of us in my day had flown airplanes with tail wheels. Um, I didn't fly the P-51, but it had a tail wheel, P-47, even the B-17 had tail wheels. So the pilots of my time were, knew what a rudder was for. But the U-2 was far, far worse than anything we'd ever flown. It was a ground-looping SOB. <laughs> About half the airplanes ever built, I think, were damaged or destroyed because of the pilots with ground loop. Tony here could probably tell you a lot more about that than I can. In 1955, I was flying fighters in Great Falls, Montana. And all of a sudden, I was told to report to SAC headquarters. General LeMay had been asked to set up a training group and to make a very long story short, four of us pilots all of whom had flown fighters in SAC and learned how to do celestial navigation, became uh, U-2 instructor pilots. We were fitted with pressure suits. Now the pressure suit that I wore is not the beautiful orange one that USR guys flew. I flew the old green one, which was a partial pressure suit. And it would squeeze the hell out of you if, you, if your engine quit. We had engine flameouts at high altitude to the tune of many, many hundreds. I had three, so that suit saved my life three times. Tony had, he mentioned he had three flameouts in one mission. We literally had hundreds of flameouts in the early U2 program. All of this was at Groom Lake. Kelly Johnson was our boss. He was head of the Skunk Works. General Yancey was my boss, head of the training program, but Kelly made all decisions. He decided who was going to fly and when. And if he didn't like the way you flew the first time, you would never fly again. It was very, very simple. He ran the show. He did an amazing job. And one of the things that struck me, first of all, I'm also an engineer, he kept telling us, one pound of weight equals one foot of altitude. So as the airplane burned off fuel, it burned about 100 gallons per hour at high altitude. That's about 700 pounds of fuel. You would gain about 700 feet every hour. The engine is at full throttle all day long, and you end up at a pretty high altitude. And one other point I want to make is you were cruising at an airspeed and if you missed it by five knots too fast you would get into compressibility. Airplane would start to shake. If you got five knots too slow the engine would quit. I mean with no warning at all. All of a sudden your suit would expand, the canopy would frost over, Nearly all of your engine, all of your instruments would quit, except the altitude and airspeed, and you were you became a glider pilot. You had to glide down to 35,000 feet before you could even attempt to make a first air start, and usually it would air start, and you'd climb back up and continue the mission. We had a lot of adventures. We trained three detachments of. CIA civilian pilots. They were all highly skilled and this is one of them sitting right here beside me. So they needed very, very little training. The navigation system they used was dead reckoning and celestial. So the little bubble on the top of the U-2 over here, that's a sextant to, to do celestial navigation you have to have an autopilot, and my autopilot never worked when I flew the airplane. By the way, one last point. 
I'm the only survivor of the initial training group. Uh, General Yancey's still alive, but he has Alzheimer's. Everybody else has died. I never made a takeoff or a landing on a runway. I flew it off the lake bed all the time, every time. I never taxied the airplane. I, they put me in the airplane and hooked me up to the oxygen system. The engine was already running. I'd push the throttle forward and take off. The landing was the most difficult part by far because you were exhausted. And in one case, I couldn't even feel in my arms. They were... I had, I had to tell myself, move the wheel left two inches, right two inches, push the left rudder, and I was a basket case. They had to lift me out of the airplane. Say that I greatly admire all of you A-12 and SR-71 air crew members and maintenance people and technicians. You did a truly amazing job. That actually is a great lead in to the other uh, person we have up here. As they say, Tony Babakwa flew the early U-2s, but he actually then graduated, if you would, to the SR-71. But uh, uh, Tony, would you like to add anything to what Lewis said about your impressions of the U-2? Well, he must have been a damn good instructor because uh, I landed on a runway and I taxied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, um, I arrived at the Groom Lake from um, Turner Air Force Base, F-84, as my roommate at uh, a year before then. Well, not a year, but uh, six or eight months before that was Frank Francis Gary Powers. And um, Frank had the hours required by CIA and uh, obviously was hired, uh, whereas I was younger, had a lot less time, but I brought up my time enough to be able to get into the program as a blue suitor. So I was Air Force all the time, not in CIA. And so I was assigned uh, TDY from Turner at the time, going to the uh, Area 51, Groom Lake, Watertown, Paradise, whatever you want to call it. We slept in trailers. We had a kind of a community hall for everything other than um, ground school. And um, there was a cement uh, block uh, restroom situation of uh, uh, where everybody went to use the toilets and um, what, two or three hangers? Yeah, two when he got there and maybe three when I got there. They brought him in with an, uh, the U-2s all folded up into a C-124 and put together there. And then the test pilot for Lockheed would uh, accept it. And then our test pilot, Air Force type, uh, Hank Meyer Dirk at the time, I remember, uh, would test pilot accept it and then us students would uh, start flying it and of course since we're the only ones checking out we graduated right from a student pilot to an instructor pilot and um, I was fortunate enough uh, if you want to call it that uh, to stay on uh, from February till June when six of those for the Air Force were built and uh, then from then on, uh, we, we flew those to Laughlin Air Force Base, Del Rio, Texas. And uh, from then on, Laughlin Air Force Base was the headquarters for U-2 and training. Uh, all the training was done from there. What happened to Area 51 after we left, you can kind of guess as far as uh, getting built up and so forth for the A-12s which were there. The SRs were not there. About two weeks of ground school, which is, there's no simulator, all single seat, no trainer, and uh, and so you soloed your first flight, as long as you took off. <laughs> and so we started out, of course, on the dry lake, which uh, you did a lot of touch and goes and hopefully stayed down the line to get the idea of how you're supposed to fly it. And then there's a 6,000 or so uh, 
a patch of asphalt that was a runway that uh, you graduated to about the third flight, I think. And so uh, we took off that little runway and then a couple of missions later, we're doing high flight, so we're donning the partial pressure suit. That partial pressure suit, I described that as like being in a corset where the full pressure suit uh, is like being a turtle in a shell. Uh, it does the same thing, prevents your blood from boiling when you uh, lose pressurization, so it keeps you alive. And um, uh, like Lou alluded to there, on my first high flight in the uh, U-2, and by the way, they would uh, it, the thing was so secret, uh, or mission, uh, that they would uh, make our routes over the most desolate areas of the USA. And so we really didn't even have, uh, most of the time did not have a, an emergency field to land on if you did have to land away from home. And so uh, I took off on this first high flight of mine and uh, I think it was about a six hour mission. And shortly after arriving, uh, you know, really being above 65,000 feet or so at the time I remember, um, I got a flame out. And so I just, because there's no field to go to, I just went down as fast as I was allowed to, to the altitude that I could go to to relight it, and hopefully it would, and it did. And that happened two more times. And I just stayed on the route, came back home, and uh, found out it was a faulty fuel control, and, uh, and apparently there was something wrong in the manufacture of it and they took care of that really uh, quickly i think the u2 was assigned to find out if there was a bomber gap the russians only built about 200 of these and the u2 discovered that we on the other hand built 2000 b47s and 744 b52s there was a bomber gap but it was in our favor the missions did what they were supposed to do, but then in 1957, another threat came up and the U-2 was called to do overflights over the Soviet Union. In October of 1957, Sputnik was launched by the Soviet Union and everything changed in the United States. But in August of 1957, something different took to the air. This is what the U-2 was assigned to find out after 1957. This is the Russian intercontinental ballistic missile, the Semyorka, which you, once it was launched, you could not stop it. The question was, how many ICBMs do the Russians have? Francis Gary Powers' mission across the Soviet Union that he was going to go from Pakistan to Norway via the heart of the Soviet Union was designed to find out how many ICBMs the Russians had. But after the U-2 was shot down, the question was, what do we do now? The answer started in 1958, because they said if the U-2 will fly at 70,000, we're going to have an airplane that will fly at 90,000. If it flew at 450 miles an hour, we'll build an airplane that will fly over 2,000 miles an hour. And the U-2 was visible on radar, which is how they shot it down. So they said, in addition, we'll make it invisible to radar. That airplane is the A-12 and followed by the SR-71, the world's fastest airplanes as well as highest flying. Next, we're going to be talking to guys who were involved in the development of the top secret A-12. 924, you see behind you, is actually the number one Blackbird. It made its first flight, which almost ended in a crash, on April 26, today's date in 1962. So we're going to talk about that. Fortunately, the Skunk Works is very good at correcting their mistakes. So when the plane actually did make its official first flight on April 30th, it was a rousing success. We have two of the CIA pilots who actually flew the A-12. I might mention the A-12 was never officially declassified until 1982. The A-12 was only in service as a reconnaissance airplane, 67, 68. 
So it was then retired and put in storage here at Palmdale without anyone knowing what it actually was. It was a single seat spy plane. So it's actually a really well kept secret because it wasn't until 1982 that Kelly Johnson received permission to write in an unclassified thing that actually the SR-71's predecessor was the A-12. These are the guys who flew the single seat A-12 rather than the two seat SR-71. So I'd like to ask them, uh, I'm gonna ask Ken Collins because I know Ken was also a test spotted on it and actually ended up bailing out of an A-12. So I'd uh, like to ask him, say, what was that like? I started out on the A-12 program in 1962. My first flight was February 63. On the day that uh, we were running some uh, subsonic engine tests, I wasn't in the pressure suit uh, because we were below uh, 50,000 feet. So, turned up uh, checking out the engine, uh, the new J-58. Uh, turned back south to near Salt Lake. They got into weather and the air data computer failed and the pitot tube, you'll notice on the new one, they have a what they call the Rosemont probe, a redundant system. It also froze up, so I lost my instrumentation and couldn't believe any of it. Uh, somewhere in the weather, it uh, decided to pitch up and go upside down and in a flat and inverted uh, spin, which was unrecoverable as far as the aircraft. So I wasn't sure on my altitude whether it was 10,000 feet or 30 because the instruments were, had been wrong previously. So I ejected, but I ejected down. The ejection system in the A-12 is excellent. If you're on the ground, it'll put you up in a 300-foot trajectory and fire the chute, separate the chute from you, and a slug will open up the parachute, and you'll land very safely, which is one of the few ejection systems that does that. They later put them in the SR-71 and in the A-12. Well, upside down, I ejected straight down, and once I broke out of the weather, I look up and I see that I have a parachute, which is a, really a good thing. And so I'm looking at the ground to see where I'm gonna land. It's all desert out there. Next thing I know, the parachute separated. And I said, you know, gosh, that's, that's not a good thing. But what it was was the drogue chute. I wasn't thinking about that at the moment. And at 15,000 feet, the main chute opened. So obviously I'm here, so it must have worked out right. <coughs> the uh, three guys in a, in a pickup truck come bouncing across the desert. They had my canopy in the back. They said, uh, come on, we'll take you over to your airplane. They you see it over there, it was burning. And I said, that's an F-105 out of Nellis. I said, it has a nuclear weapon on board. And they said, we're getting out of here, are you going with us? So four of us got in the front of their pickup truck. They dropped me off at Windover Highway Patrol, Windover, Utah. Highway Patrol, I made a phone call. They flew up security people and people up to start cleaning up the mess. But uh, that was all part of the engine testing anyway on the J-58. You know, I heard that, I heard that story before and I said, the cover story he devised on the spur of the moment to keep people away from the airplane was better than any cover story I ever heard on the entire U2 program. Because, yeah, I can, I can understand why the guy didn't want to now get near it. Ken, uh, I once saw a program where you commented on the very first time you saw the A-12 and what you thought it looked like. The selection program for the A-12 and CIA uh, had the Air Force do the program selection. Uh, they didn't tell us what we were going to fly. They said it's a, a, a sort of an astronaut program. It's a high altitude uh, vehicle. They didn't say it was an aircraft or anything. We never got to see a picture. We were never told what it was. But we signed up anyway because we were very interested in it. Uh, I went out to uh, down to Burbank and got on an airplane and flew to Area 51. And they, uh, Colonel Doug Nelson, who was the ops officer there, said, well, would you like to see what you're going to be working on? And I, of course, definitely interested. 
he took me out to the hangar. It was one of the big old hangars with the windows up top, and we walked through the people door, and the light was filtered through, and everything. The airplane was black, and it was just amazing. It looked like a spaceship, and we were, you know, when you saw it, you couldn't just amaze that this thing. You look at it today, and you see it. Just imagine in your own mind what it looked like when you walked in front of the filtered light. Just amazing aircraft. After they shut the 812 program down which for six years, uh, I was very fortunate in being able to fly the SR-71 for six years. You may recall a television series called Call to Glory with Craig T. Nelson playing the part of a U-2 test pilot who was given the opportunity to fly the SR. They actually filmed the scene across the runway at Site 2. It took them five hours to, to film a scene that ran 45 seconds on TV. But the actor that was playing the test pilot walked around the SR-71 with his hands in his pockets, kind of looking at it, saying, yeah, that's really kind of interesting. And I, so I was whispering, because we were watching from behind the cameras, and I said, I know people think test pilots are really Joe Cool, but in 1960, if you'd been flying the jet, the U-2, basically, to see an airplane that looked like a spaceship that can go 2,000 miles an hour, and you're gonna be flying it, I said, we would not be just walking around saying, yeah, sure, I can do that, we ain't that cool. Mr. Murray, uh, would you like to add some comments to that? My name is Frank Murray. And I have the unique distinction of being the last guy to be trained to fly the A-12. Ken was in the first bunch. I was the last bunch. So I came in late in the program, but it had been going for several years before I got in the airplane. But I caught up quickly. Uh, I don't think I can add anything to uh, what's already been said about the A-12 development, only that I was a happy part of it at the very end of the training scheme, but still I was very happy to be there. I will listen with interest to others. Actually, he flew operational missions, of course, in the A-12, including overflights of North Korea that uh, were part of the effort to find the USS Pueblo when it was captured uh, by the North Koreans. So he's too modest uh, to mention that. That is the single seat A-12. They only built about a dozen of them. A number of them crashed because it was in the early days and they were retired in secret and it's great that now uh, they're, able, they're able to honor them for what they did. The people sitting here received CIA medals uh, basically uh, here in the, in the 21st century recognize them, them for what they did. So I'd like to have a hand for the guys that flew faster than a speeding bullet all by themselves. Uh, actually, the airplane that people are most familiar with, of course, is the SR-71, which is a two-seater. I'm the back seater. Uh, the second seat was in the position where the camera was on the A-12 behind the pilot and the sensors which were behind the pilot on the A-12 are scattered throughout the airplane. That airplane remained in service with the United States Air Force for over 25 years, the SR-71. It was only retired prematurely, many of us think, in 1990. So we're gonna talk about the very first flight of the SR-71, and here to do that is Mr. Bob Gilliland, who's uh, down there in the wheelchair on the end. I'm gonna run a brief video that shows that flight, which was December 22nd. It was on a day very much like this, snow-capped mountains in the distance, kind of cold and windy. He flew the SR-71 on its first flight solo with no one behind him. So he flew, I think that's the only flight I know of. I know of maybe one other where the SR-71 was flown with no backseater. So I'm gonna show you that video.
All right, next I'd like to welcome uh, some uh, members of the Skunk Works leadership uh, uh, to the stage. They have a gift for um, Mr. Gilliland. Um, Eric Knudsen, who's the Deputy Vice President of Operations and Advanced Projects for the Skunk Works. Uh, Steve Justice, who's the Director for Advanced Systems Development. Um, the Skunk Works Advanced Design Group. And Kent Burns, who um, is the Program Manager and SR70, former SR71 Reactive Vision Chief Engineer and also one of our board members. You've heard Mr. Gilliland talk a lot today uh, and the others about what it was like to fly the Blackbird uh, and what an honor it is. But I want to tell you one other thing about him. I mean, that is what an incredible gentleman that he is. While being uh, what it takes to be a test pilot, which is you have to be brave, uh, there's a certain amount of daring to it. There's also a certain amount of calculation that goes with it, a certain amount of conservatism. Um, all, piled all on top of that, as well as the foundation underneath it, was a very uh, centered man, uh, a man that cared about the people around him, was very grateful for the people that gave him a very safe airplane to fly. I got to know that by going out to dinner with him and, uh, where, where did where'd your son go? He'll be back, okay. Um, and talk with him at length about what it was like growing up, uh, around uh, around this man, uh, as well as how he handled himself throughout his career in the Air Force as a test pilot and as well as in private business. So Mr. Gilliland, um, it is with tremendous pleasure we give you something that is very special to us uh, and that very few people receive. Um, Eric, would you like to... This is the, the bronze skunk. We give this to people who demonstrate a uh, a true uh, capture of the skunk works itself, uh, what the skunk means, and uh, and carry that with them and demonstrate it throughout their lives. So, Mr. Gilliland, you are absolutely the character of the skunk works, and it is such an honor to know you, sir. Uh, thank you very much for the honor and uh, the skunk I've got here. The rest of the SR-71 story is basically 25 years of doing, uh, of doing, keeping an eye on the nation, on the world's trouble spots at the request of national command authorities. Uh, I uh, basically never flew operational SR missions. I did that in the RF-4 in Vietnam, but I got to fly with BC Thomas here and know Ed Yielding quite well. I, of course, am a backseater in the SR, and BC was one of the pilots I often flew with. In fact, I flew my last SR-71 flight with him. BC had a very distressing habit, which when I flew with him once, I would hear an, uh-oh, guess what? And I went, okay, I saw the master caution come light, come on. I only have a couple master caution lights. I don't have any, any idea. So I'd say, so he'd say, oh, such and such. So I said, okay. So in the debrief, I said, you know, I don't really appreciate playing 20 questions. Is an animal or vegetable or mineral at Mach 3? So BC promised he would never do that again. The next mission, uh-oh, guess what? I thought we went over this and you weren't going to do that again. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. And all. So after that, he is trainable. He never did it again. But BC has more flying time in the SR-71 than any pilot, uh, over 1,200 hours. Uh, Ed Yielding doesn't have quite that many hours. How many? 795. 85, 785 hours. The SR-71 is the only airplane in the world where our pilots keep track of their time down to a tenth of an hour. Usually we'll say around 4,000 hours, something like that, with the U-2. With the SR-71, you, you, you keep track of it down to tenths of a minute. Now, many of the missions that they flew today still are a little sensitive for discussions. That's why when I showed you that video, it was at the Milden Hall Air Show, because the SR-71, the super secret Blackbird, became probably the best air show airplane in the world. BC got to fly a number of those. 
as did Ed. But uh, I'd like to hand the microphone over to BC. And he's a man of few words, not really. But, but just to have him make a few remarks about flying the SR operationally and his great experience. Then I'm gonna ask Ed, who flew the last flight, setting the transcontinental speed record. 64 minutes, LA to Washington. 64 minutes, I can't get to San Fernando from Palmdale. Yeah, so he did coast to coast, basically LA to Washington in 64 minutes. So he's gonna talk about that. But first, I'll just ask uh, BC to just give a couple of reminiscences of what it was like flying it for over 1,200 hours. Well, flying the SR-71, uh, to me anyway, whether I flew operational or test or training mission, I flew it all the same. And, uh, and the airplane, uh, as far as I know, responded the same. But I, I can tell you one little story about uh, flying operationally that was a little bit different uh, than uh, flying training missions or in any other airplane, and that is our operational missions were very secret. And we couldn't tell anybody what we were doing, including our girlfriends or wives or mothers or whoever. Well, I was uh, dating uh, this uh, young flight attendant at the time. I was a bachelor living in the bachelor officer's quarters, and my uh, backseater was uh, my roommate. And um, there was a, uh, when they declared martial law in Poland, I believe, I think it was in 1981, I was uh, flying a, a T-38, got down on the ground, and uh, the uh, director of operations came to me and said, get packed and you're gonna leave on a tanker in about uh, 45 minutes to go to England because we need to uh, fly uh, uh, missions over uh, Poland, around Poland to see uh, whether the uh, Soviet Union were uh, massing troops along the Polish border. And uh, at the time, my uh, girlfriend, flight attendant, Nancy, was uh, in San Francisco and uh, we had already arranged that she was gonna come up and visit me. And she was already on her way. And there's no way, no cell phones or anything I could get, a, a, get a, in touch with her. So I had to leave a very cryptic note because she couldn't ask anyone else where I was because no one else would tell her. And uh, the note said, um, gee, I'm sorry that I'm not here as I promised I would be. And I'll call you as soon as I can. And uh, so then I uh, uh, rushed on off to uh, England where Maury Rosenberg uh, got the honor of flying the airplane over, and he flew the first uh, missions to determine uh, where the Soviet Union was at the time, and I got to fly the second. And then we decided to make a uh, permanent, uh, not, not a permanent dead, but we decided to, to uh, or they decided to, we would then uh, fly out of Milden Hall. So it was a couple of weeks before I got back. And in the meantime, I had one of my friends go to my apartment, get all my clothes that I needed, and uh, ship it back on the next tanker. The uh, thing is, I was very uh, concerned that uh, she would not understand that that note didn't mean that I wanted to break up with her. It meant that I really was sorry I couldn't tell her where I was going and that I would be back someday. Anyway, there she is right there, Nancy Thomas. Why don't you stand up? Hey. So she stuck with me. Okay, one more story. <laughs> um, there was a time when um, we were flying uh, missions from uh, California to Murmansk, Soviet Union. And I, I described basically what the uh, sortie was like. It was uh, take off out of Beale with a half a fuel load, refuel over Idaho, and then make our way over to Newfoundland, refuel there, fly over to uh, east of England to the North Sea, another refueling, and then fly up the coast of Norway, turn right at uh, Finland, and go around to uh, the Soviet Union and uh, photograph uh, the uh, subpins at Romansk. Well, on, a, on my way back, uh, as I was refueling for the uh, fourth time over the uh, North Sea, I had a generator problem and a low oil leak in, the, uh, in one engine. And uh, both of those uh, necessitated that I land as soon as possible. The landing as soon as possible was a uh, rather small strip in Norway called Bodo, uh, pronounced Buda, B-O-D-O. -O. And um, so I came into uh, Buda, which is a joint uh, civilian Norwegian Air Force base, quite unannounced. 
The only people that knew I was coming in was myself and the uh, approach control and then the tower. But when I landed, of course I didn't know what to expect, but uh, normal landing and taxi in, and they had a, a, a car to, to uh, bring me into the spot that they wanted to park me. Well, when I was met, I was met by a guy who, uh, when I opened the canopy and they put the uh, ladder up there, the, the guy came up there and says, oh, and I says, uh, what is your name? And I says, I'm B.C. Thomas. And he says, oh, do you know Bill Groninger? Well, they were at the pilot train together. Well, as it turned out, now this is a true story, that the commander of the base was a, a man by the name of General Omont, and he was a first lieutenant at the same base when Francis Gary Powers was scheduled to land there. So it's the same base that Francis Gary Powers was uh, aiming for when he was shot down. Well, what happened there was that the military uh, people at Bodo, when uh, Francis Gary Powers was flying his U-2, they knew that he was coming in, but the civilian authorities did not. But there was a big row in the Norwegian government about being uh, roped into uh, foreign espionage intrigue with the Soviet Union because the Norwegians, although they are a member of NATO and are good friends, they uh, like to maintain uh, friendly relations with the Soviet Union because they uh, were so physically uh, close to them. So the general, I didn't know at the time, but he told me later that he was very concerned because here was this spy plane, they call it the spy plane, coming in and landing. He knew nothing about it but he thought he was might be uh, blamed for it. So we uh, he put us under uh, virtually house arrest. He uh, gave, uh, I had a first lieutenant F-104 pilot that was with, my, with me for three days. Never left my side, literally. And um, then uh, we met the uh, deputy ambassador, whatever they're called, uh, under ambassador, he came to the base. It was a real big deal because it had never been done. The first time that the SR-71 had landed in continental Europe. So they really didn't know how to handle us. And we were just there to do as they say. Anyway, I, I took off that, uh, that morning about midnight, thinking I would be back about 10.30 or 11 in the morning. And uh, then they decided to, uh, that we would go to uh, England and operate out of there for a while. So again, it was two weeks before I came back. So such exciting things like that happen uh, in the operational squadron that wouldn't happen in any other squadron. My name, my name is Ed Yielding, and I had the honor of flying the SR-71 from, uh, I guess it was December of 1983 until the airplane retired in early 1990. And by the way, uh, my first flight in the Blackbird was with B.C. Thomas here. He was my instructor. <laughs> Great instructor, had him for uh, simulators, and, and then my first uh, flight in the Blackbird. Really an uh, honor to fly with the uh, BC. Anyway, I uh, flew operational missions out of Beale Air Force Base for four and a half years. And, and then in uh, 19, uh, December of 1987, uh, I had applied and was accepted to be a test pilot here at Palmdale. So we flew test uh, missions in the uh, SR-71 Blackbird. Uh, from in 1988 and 1989. As a matter of fact, our uh, secretary is here with us, Joyce Baker and her husband, uh, Jim Baker. Joyce, would you raise your, your hand? <laughs> she was a wonderful secretary for us <laughs> and really enjoyed uh, test missions out of Palm Bell. It was really exciting working with the uh, Lockheed uh, engineers, the Skunk Works. Then in late 1989, <laughs> Congress voted to uh, retire the Blackbird, much to our disappointment. But the Smithsonian asked if we would uh, bring an SR-71 to the Smithsonian Institution for display. And they said, well, since you're taking off from California, how about setting a transcontinental speed record as you bring the airplane to Washington? So <clears throat> I was fortunate to be the pilot. And then my RSO was JT Vita. A uh, tremendous guy, really a, a great uh, RSO, a wonderful friend and a wonderful uh, family man. <clears throat> he had more time in the Blackbird than any other crew member in history at 1,392.7 hours. And sadly, he, he got cancer uh, a year after we flew our 
this mission and passed away in September of uh, 1992. And we're uh, honored to have his uh, widow, Sherry Vita, with us. Would you raise your hand? So, uh, so on uh, March the 6th of 1990, uh, JT Vita and I briefed up our last SR-71 flight. We briefed in the wee hours of the morning of March the 6th, 1990. We, we took off at 4.30 in the morning California time, which was 7.30 in the morning in Washington where we're taking the airplane. They wanted us to do a transcontinental speed record uh, coast to coast, so we flew out over the Pacific Ocean and air refueled. Fuel was going to be real tight for our flight across the across the country, so we had to move our start climb point to the east uh, enough so that we would arrive in Washington D.C. with enough uh, fuel to land safely. So we refueled in the pitch darkness, 200 miles out over the Pacific, which was no problem because we had refueled at night many many times. We uh, got a full load of fuel lit the afterburners and got a 200 mile running start. We uh, passed the west coast, accelerating through Mach 2.5. We passed Los Angeles, accelerating through 2.6, and then seven minutes later, we <coughs> were at a cruise speed of Mach 3.3, which is 2,190 miles an hour. We held that speed all the way across the country, so we streaked right across the United States faster than a rifle bullet from coast to coast. During that flight, uh, we thought, thought about what a great country we have, made great by the hard work, dedicated hard work, sacrifices, courage, and prayers of our forefathers. <coughs> and then JT and I thought about how fortunate we were to fly that great, great airplane, the SR-71, and how fortunate we were to serve with hundreds of other highly dedicated men and women uh, who designed, maintained, supported, and flew the Blackbird. Uh, over its 25 years of uh, service during the Cold War. The Blackbird, the Blackbird performed a vital, a very important vital mission through 25 years of the Cold War and we felt so fortunate to have been a part of that uh, vital service uh, with the Blackbird. When we crossed the East Coast, no airplane has ever flown from coast to coast across the United States faster than the Blackbird did that day. So the official coast-to-coast -coast speed record, 67 minutes and 54 seconds. We set uh, three three city-to-city -city records, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., 64 minutes and 20 seconds, uh, Kansas City to Washington, D.C., 25 minutes and 59 seconds, and then uh, St. Louis to Cincinnati took us eight minutes and 32 seconds. <laughs> okay. It was such an honor to such an honor to fly that uh, that mission. We uh, made a descending a left hand turn as we crossed the East Coast. We uh, at, at 40,000 feet, as descending through 40,000 feet, we raised the nose so we could get uh, subsonic, so that we would not uh, would not lay a sonic boom over uh, Philadelphia <clears throat> as we made the left turn. Uh, then we descended at 25,000 feet. We joined with a, a tanker and took just a little bit of fuel. We had enough fuel without refueling to land with the required fuel reserves, but we they wanted us to make a few passes for the crowd, so we air refueled and took just a little bit of fuel so we could make a couple of passes for the crowd. We made our first pass at 800 feet perpendicular to the runways, which we had coordinated with the uh, authorities at, at Dulles Airport. And then and then we circled around and made our pass for the crowd just under 200 feet and lit the afterburner so the crowd could see that beautiful sight of the orange afterburners behind that beautiful black airplane and feel the power of those two big powerful engines. We, we uh, pulled up into a downwind and rocked our wings in a goodbye gesture to the, to the crowd because we knew that was going to be the last flight for, the, for that airplane, for that Blackbird. We landed and deployed that big orange drag chute one last time, taxied in, <clears throat> raised our canopies, and JT and I climbed out, shook hands, and it was a strange feeling because we were both real excited because we had just set some speed records. 
uh, but at the same time feeling sad because that was going to be our last flight together and the, our last flight in the Blackbird, and that'll be the last time that Blackbird would ever fly. So we're feeling sad as well as exciting at the same time. <clears throat> And we uh, had a short news conference and answered questions about the Blackbird and had a nice reception that evening with uh, Lockheed. So JT and I were extremely fortunate to, for, the, for that uh, flight, fortunate to have served in the Blackbird. Thank you. Uh, actually, the, the SR-71, of, take, of course, was taken out of operational service after the record flight. Uh, however, NASA continued to fly the airplane for a couple of more years, uh, and the last flight of a Blackbird actually was uh, in October of 1999. It was a NASA uh, airplane, and it flew over the crowd uh, at Mach 3 at 75,000 feet, uh, streaming gas, so the people on the ground could see it because normally you cannot see an SR-71, it's so high up. But by dumping gas, they created a contrail, and the contrail was moving three times as fast as any contrail you've ever seen. So I'm sure there were people that thought it was actually a UFO, that it was an invasion from Mars, but uh, actually it wasn't. Then the sonic boom hits you about 70 seconds after the airplane has passed over you. I was at Edwards for that, and that, that was pretty interesting. They were going to try and do it the next day, but the airplane broke. So that ended up being the last flight of the SR-71. So all of the airplanes now, at one time, they were going to scrap all the airplanes except for one at the Smithsonian and one at the Air Force Museum in Dayton. However, thanks to Senator John Glenn, he said, no, I don't think that's a good idea. The Air Force agreed with a, a powerful senator like him. So now all the airplanes are now on display at, uh, air, at museums throughout the world. All of them are in the United States, except for one in England, as a thank you to England for allowing us to base the SR at Milden Hall. So uh, actually, there's still a fair number of airplanes. Unfortunately, they'll never fly again. Nevertheless, it's still the fastest airplane uh, in the history of aviation and probably will remain that way. Uh, so it's, it's truly an accomplishment. The uh, guys that flew the airplane here, like I said, it was created during the Cold War in order to basically find out things because we didn't have satellites then and they were blowing up on the pad all the time. So basically, they were created to basically find information the country badly needed and they accomplished it in spades. The U-2, of course, is still flying today. We'll see for how much longer. But nevertheless, the, the motto of reconnaissance is alone, unarmed, and unafraid. We had a question mark after the unafraid, but actually all the people that were here represent the guys that flew those airplanes in harm's way. So I think uh, I'd like to give them all a big hand. And actually, I forgot, Mike Relja, actually, I told a story at the last open house we had, and he basically wants to correct something I said factually. So Mike Relja, uh, the microphone is yours. The last time uh, we did this, Bill told a story about a FCF we were doing out of Palmdale on one of the depot airplanes. And uh, he made it sound like I was clairvoyant, that uh, I kept telling them there was something wrong with the airplane, I could just feel there was something wrong with the airplane. What I want to clarify is the day we were flying that airplane, I actually saw a hydraulic leak. The left ADS was leaking hydraulic fluid. I had an inspector on board. He seemed to think that the system was over-serviced. When we got to the end of the runway, I had the people open a small panel, which we call the peanut panel, 
and we tried to drain the over service uh, position. When I saw that it was not draining and that it was leaking, that's when I asked Bill and uh, Cal Jewett to bring the airplane home. As they turned back and started heading back down the taxiway to Site 2, they lost the left generator. So again, I just wanted to clear that up that it wasn't me supposing something was wrong, but actually seeing a leak. Mike, I want to thank you for basically confirming that, that not starting an urban myth that you're clairvoyant. In reality, though, it indicates exactly the point I was trying to make. Cal and I both wanted to go fly, but when Mike Relja says, uh, I think maybe we ought to take it back to the barn, there is no question. He said, if Mike says so, we won't even question it. And sure enough, that's why we thought he was clairvoyant, because the generator failed as we taxied back. And believe me, and when things go wrong at Mach 3, usually one thing goes wrong, then a second, then a third, and it could be a real handful. Maintenance on this airplane was critical because you're traveling so fast, if anything goes wrong, it can really be critical. So it's very important to have really skilled maintenance workers, both Lockheed and the Air Force, and Mike exemplifies that, had really good guys. He worked for NASA maintaining their airplane after the Air Force got rid of the SR, but a lot of people that flew the airplane felt a lot better knowing he was the guy that was overseeing it. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.